This is no stranger to tackling big problems in the Django core code, uh, but today he's going to tell us about all of the things he hasn't tackled yet. He's going to talk to us about what he would do differently were he doing Django from the ground up. So please give a round of applause for Alex Gaynor. Okay, that's backwards. <laughs> is X what switches it? Neat. Okay, cool. Thank you. Uh, and thanks everybody for uh, coming out. Uh, like you said, uh, I'm here to talk about sort of all the things I would do differently if I got to do Django over again from the ground up with everything I've learned from building apps with Django to working on Django itself to watching other frameworks and just sort of, and perhaps I think most importantly, working with code bases that are totally different in scope, working on things that are not web related at all and what I can learn from sort of the architecture of those software projects. But uh, before we begin, just want to give a huge thank you to uh, RDO, my company. Uh, we're hiring, you should come work for us. Uh, ops, front end, de back end development, we're hiring for everything, we're awesome. Uh, come talk to me afterwards if you're interested. Um, so sort of, I think to give some context to all the critiques I want to offer, um, you know, obviously I'm, it's a DjangoCon tradition to uh, have someone from really outside the community tell us what we're doing wrong from the perspective of something else that they're working on, which is incredibly valuable in terms of keeping us from being too insular as a community, too, uh, too inwardly focused on how, how the way we do things as being the only way. So my perspective is, of course, someone who, I work in my day job on Django, I work on Django itself in my free time. My perspective is very Django oriented. Uh, so essentially my critique is from the experience of having worked with Django and seen its flaws directly, rather than necessarily having worked with anything better. Of course, I do all this work with Django because I haven't found anything better yet. So my hope is that we can find a way to build the better Django and have that whatever Django's replacement is, whatever the next generation of web framework is, to have that be Django, to have Django be the next Django. So this, this talk basically has three parts. What is Django, which is either sounds like the world's most beginner question, or I hope something a little more, a little more philosophical, a little more, you know, not what it, what's a Django? I, I've, I've never seen this thing before. You know, then of course, what's wrong with it? Uh, because there's no point in rewriting something if you can't identify the flaws. Probably wouldn't be trying to rewrite it if you didn't have some flaws. And how and uh, if can we fix these problems and how we can. So I'm, I, I spend a lot of time developing Django itself. Why am I giving this as a talk? Why don't, why don't I, just, I just go write a patch, right? I have critiques. I think I have solutions. You know, patch is welcome, right? This is open source. Anybody can write a patch. So. Uh, you know, historically, sometimes when people give these critique of Django talks, people go and turn uh, you know each item into a ticket. Like, okay, this is a critique. This is an action item we can take. This is not appropriate. That that's not appropriate for this talk. All my ideas, I have totally chucked the idea of backwards compatibility in looking towards you know what is the ideal future Django, and that's not appropriate for Django the project. Django the project has tens of thousands of users. Who knows how many sites? Peop lots and lots of people writing apps against it every day, and I think a large part of our popularity is due to our pretty strict backwards compatibility policy. So this is not appropriate to just chuck this all for Django uh, core right now. I also haven't spent any time thinking about how easy these ideas are to pick up for new users. Uh, Django is incredible documentation, which I think is really attractive to new users, but I don't think documentation would be enough to paper over you know, an architecture that's, if it's really fundamentally harder. So I haven't spent time thinking about that. And I also haven't spent any time trying to build a real application on top of this. I pretty uh, firmly believe that whatever the next generation of frameworks is, like the current generation of frameworks, Rails, Django, and friends, they're going to be drawn from people building real apps and trying to take the good ideas they get from there. So I don't think someone should just go out and build what I have, what I'm going to talk to you guys today about, and just say, you know, this is this is the way a, a web framework you know, ought to be done. This is what Alex said. No, you want to take these ideas, try to build something with them, and figure out all the problems with them. And then once you find all the problems with the new ideas, then maybe we're on our way to having you know, a good next generation of framework. But, so what is Django? Django is a couple things. 
you know, on the website, I think it says it's a web framework for pragmatic professionals with deadlines or something like that. And it's a nice slogan. It doesn't tell us what Django is. Django is actually uh, three things, really, or maybe a lot more, depending on how you count that third one. So it's an abstraction over WSGI. WSGI gives us uh, an interface to talk with our web server, and Django gives us this higher level abstraction of requests and responses. And this is, this is really at the core of what Django is. You wouldn't use any of the other parts of Django if you weren't already building a web application, probably. Um, but so the second part of Django is it's a command line application runner. You know, we have manage.py and Django admin, uh, Django admin, and these two scripts are really fundamental to a lot of the ways we interact with Django. So we don't think about Django as a command line runner, but that's a pretty core part of how we interact with it for most of our day-to-day -day development. And finally, it's a set of libraries that we use a lot for doing web development. We have an ORM, we have templates, we have a caching library, we have internationalization, we have localization, we have you know, a huge array of stuff. And all, but all these aren't sort of core to Django. These are things that are really useful for building web applications. But you know, they could live somewhere else if we wanted them to. Uh, maybe it'd be nice if they lived somewhere else. But they're not sort of fundamental to how people use Django. They are a set of tools we use with Django and that are, of course, included with Django. So, you know, we have this set of libraries. What is, uh, what is the problem with Django that I want to talk about? And uh, actually, I'm going to present uh, two problems with Django, sort of two fundamental problems, I think. The first is going to be really short. I'm going to spend absolutely no time thinking about it, but I'm hoping that everyone else here will spend a lot of time thinking about it, and uh, everything else will get better then. And the second, where I'm going to spend most of this talk, I'm going to actually try to present a solution to. So uh, I think the first one is in fundamentally how we think about Django. And uh, that's, uh, I spent a lot of time uh, reading the Django user's mailing list or in uh, Pound Django and IRC. I spent a lot of time there. And I see the question, how do I do X in Django? How do I uh, render a list of forms? How do, I, uh, how do I write this type of application? And, the, and if you're thinking in those terms, we already have a problem. Django has encompassed your worldview, and that's not a good thing. Because Django is just Python. If you're asking the question, how do I do X in Django, you've got a problem. Because the way you do X in Django is the same way you do it in every web framework. You read a variable from, uh, the po from post. Yeah, Django is a slightly different API, but fundamentally getting post variables is the same in every other framework. If you just want to do something, start with, I would do this the same way I would do it in PHP or a raw Python CGI script. I'd read my post variables and I'd write all my logic from scratch. That, that's how you do it in Django. The better question, I think, is does Django have something for X? Because Django's got a lot of libraries that make it really easy to do a lot of different things. So once, I think fundamentally we need to get to a better place of accepting that Django is just Python and that the way to do X in Django is the same way you do X in any other web framework which is you start with thinking about conceptually, how do I want to solve this problem? And then you look to see if Django is a thing to help you out with it. You don't need to ask how to do it in Django. Like, you should never be blocked on this. It should never be a blocker that I can't do X in Django because Django is just this thing that takes requests and returns responses. That's like how all of HTTP works. So if you can't do X in Django, we have more fundamental problems. And maybe that means you need to spend more time thinking about HTTP. Because that also defines how we do things in Django. But so uh, that's sort of my high level thing I want everybody thinking about, because I don't have a good answer to how we move towards this. My second thing is uh, I suspect to be a little underwhelming. And this is, I think, the fundamental problem with all of Django. Testing in Django sucks. It is terrible. It is awful. And I think every other problem uh, that sort of I would want to present to Django present as a problem in Django could be considered a subset of testing in Django sucks. If testing in Django was better, I think every other critique I have would just be instantly solved and everything would be good and we would be in a state of uh, solved uh, problems. Uh, there would be no problems in Django if testing didn't suck. No. I mean, of course, there would still be bugs and everything else. But I think this would address a lot of the fundamental architectural concerns. So for those of you who haven't already bought into automated testing, this is my one minute pitch on why if you're not testing, you're just completely crazy. First of all, the alternative to te automated testing is not not testing, it's manual testing. I don't know about you guys, I got into computers because I thought it was really cool that the computer would do things for me. 
Like, that was a really cool idea. Uh, going all the way back to like elementary school when I figured out how to program my calculator to solve quadratic equations for me. Like, it was cool that the computer did stuff for me. It should be cool that the computer tests our applications for us. Like, it's incredible to realize, hey, I basically know my app works. Um, and it's just slower to manual test. And you can't manual test comprehensively. There's 101 problems with manual testing that other people have detailed better. Uh, and so, of course, you need the testing in the first place because you are going to introduce bugs. No one I know writes perfect code with the possible exception of Adrian back there. And, but I think most importantly, uh, if you're doing testing really well, it changes the way you write software. Even if you didn't catch a single bug with your tests, I think it would be valuable because testing forces you to constrain the way you think. Because normally when you write software, uh, it just has to spit something, you just have to spit out some HTML at the end of the day. How you get there doesn't matter. But when you're trying to write good tests, you're fundamentally thinking about the question, how do I constrain my inputs? How do I constrain my outputs? A good test, you take a very, very known state of the universe, you do something, and you check that the universe is in a new place. That's, that's a really good test. Uh, whether it's in terms of input and output to a function, checking the contents of a database, you, you take a known state, you mutate it in some way, and then you, uh, you check the result. And I don't think we, if you look at a, just a web application that's spitting HTML out, I don't think you have a lot of small chunks with which you can talk about what is the state of the universe when I start and what is it at the end. So uh, here's an example test with uh, uh, written against Django today. Got a model name track and uh, I'm testing some method I wrote on it. Who here thinks this is a, a pretty good test in uh, written with Django? Just hands up. Do you think this is a pretty good test? No one thinks this is a good test? OK, one person thinks it's a good test. I, I would say this is a not bad test in Django uh, right now. Uh, this is probably about as good of a test as you can write about Django right now, I would say. And so I guess none of you uh, agree with me, either because you're predicting I'm about to critique it or because you guys have some more critiques that I don't. But I, I think this is an OK test. We, uh, we create a model and we check that uh, its default state doesn't have the, its can stream method returns false. Uh, if you don't have any writes on a track, you can't stream it. So we're checking some uh, basic logic. It's, it's pretty constrained. Uh, you could argue you shouldn't hit the database. There's no need to create the track, uh, whatever. Uh, so there may be some issues. But I think this is about as good a test case as you could write in Django today. So the problem is you can't write a better uh, test case in Django today, which I, I think that test case has a lot of really fundamental flaws. Because when we talk about constraining the state of the universe, that test, it looks like it's got a pretty small universe. We it starts with nothing. We create a track object. And uh, we go from there. In reality, there is a huge amount of universe going around that you can't see in that test. And that scares me. So this is, uh, this is like the universe that happened before you ran that test. A database was created with SyncDB uh, for every single app in your entire project. That test used one model or maybe a few models if uh, CanStream was checking for some related models. Pretty few number of models compared to your entire project, which maybe has 50 models, 100 models, who knows. Tons of models just got created, which is slow and extra stuff and just more universe. We, we want less universe. Tons of signal handlers were fired that did things like create permissions. You have three permissions for every model that's created, whether you specify them or not. Uh, you also created a bunch of content types for contrib content types. Those were all installed. You loaded all the initial data fixtures. Uh, if there were other fix if other fixtures had been listed on the test, those would have been installed as well. And there's probably a bunch of other stuff I missed. For example, if your project defined any of its own signal handlers that were maybe run post SyncDB, those were all run as well. Uh, I think for some reason uh, custom uh, SQL isn't necessarily run. So you have this weird dichotomy of normal SyncDB does one thing and this does another. Like you have a lot of universe plus one other giant piece of universe, Django Conf settings. This is the magic global at the center of everything driven by the environmental variable Django settings module. And this, this infects everything you do with Django. It has little descendants everywhere, it, like uh, the default storage for a file field. Uh, the template tags you use are all, uh, the set of those comes from, from uh, your installed app setting, and those get stored somewhere. 
everything in Django sort of runs on this. Whether you use internationalization or not is controlled here. Everything has its root here. And you didn't see that at all in that test. You have no idea what this thing looks like when you wrote that test. For all you know, it's fundamentally changing the behavior of everything. But you can't know because that test has tons and tons of state beyond what you can see. Uh, the programming language Haskell has this idea of a, a monad, which I didn't really fully understand until I started uh, working on this talk. And uh, basically the idea of a monad is, in Haskell, everything, every function is supposed to be just the result of its inputs. Like the same way you think of a factorial function, you know the results just by looking at the, the arguments that are written right there in the, in the def line. Uh, in Haskell, every function has to be like that. You can't have a function that looks at global state. So they have this idea of a monad. And basically, a monad encapsulates the universe. If you want a function to operate on something outside of its arguments, it needs to take the universe as a parameter. So if you want to do something like write data from a file, read a database, you need a monad because you want to talk to the outside universe. We don't have that constraint in uh, Python. We, don't, we can write functions that do whatever they like with the outside universe. But I think if we thought about them as if we had to be a little more careful with what the universe was, we'd probably be in a lot better state. So I think the idea of uh, how a test ought to work is you tell the test what resources you need to set, be, have set up. You let it know what the universe should look like. Uh, the test runner is then responsible for doing the necessary preparation, whether that's creating the database tables, uh, getting config options in the right place, uh, maybe uh, setting up uh, some other resources, Redis, a file on disk, uh, whatever, and then it gives you the test in a known state that you specified for an individual test. Right now, the state of Django comes from two places, uh, the way your test is set up. It comes from either what you have in your settings.py or random other code that happened to be run uh, before then. And that's pretty scary to me because it means fundamentally I don't know what the universe is going to be like when I run my test, which means I can't write a good test. And as a result, I think no global state should be used anywhere. So a first pass of sort of what I think a test maybe ought to look like is, uh, is this. You let it know, here's the config I want to run my uh, test under. And um, you know the main thing is here, I only need the library uh, app installed. I don't need auth installed to check that uh, I don't have any writes on this track. I don't need comments installed. I don't need content types. I don't need anything. I just need the library the track object to do this test. Uh, does this test look better to people? Better than the first one? All right, a few hands. So it looks a little better. There's a, it looks like we pretty well have all the state isolated. Like we're now controlling what the state of the universe is a little more precisely. The problem is there is still a giant global here. And it is just lurking. You can't see it. But it is just underlying everything in here. And what that is is, how does track know what database it's supposed to hit right here? Track is some global, is some class that exists in my library slash models.py. I didn't tell it what settings it goes to. I didn't tell it what database it goes to. But somehow inside this test, it knows. It knows. It knows what database it's supposed to hit. It knows what database router it's supposed to use. It knows everything. And I didn't tell it anywhere. So we got to approach the problem of how do we kill all this global state, in my view. Because this global state scares me. Because it means I got data passing in weird places. It means I can't do things like run two Django projects in the same WSGI process. You can't do that because we got all this global state. So we got to kill it. So to do that, we have to understand where does Django start. Because if you don't want to have global state, you need local state. Like Those are the two choices. And so we need to figure out where to start, where to create all this local state. And so right now, Django has basically two entry points, usually. Excuse me. Uh, we have our, a WSGI file, where uh, we, we have the uh, web server uh, sort of interface starts. And we have a manage.py file that, uh, that has the command line runner's interface. And so we need to control these. And so I think as a first step, we should probably throw away the idea of uh, Django generating stuff for you. We should throw out the idea of start project. When you look at other frameworks like uh, Flask in particular or Pyramids, they don't generate code for you. You start writing code yourself. And I think when you start with that, 
you're in a much better place. Like the framework is it's not controlling you, right? You got to get free of it. So uh, here's what I would start with. Uh, maybe start writing an app.py. This is what maybe I think it should start look start looking like. We uh, we have this fundamental thing in our core, and this is this is where the naming scheme gets really terrible because we have the idea of WSGI applications and we have the idea of a Django application, and they're pretty different. And this Django application is prob is kind of close to the uh, the WSGI concept. But really, this is just because I think naming it a Django project inside your code sounds weird. So this app idea is, is pretty much the idea of what a project is right now. So we want to start, and we, uh, we want to you know, we create, we've got a new thing. And uh, if we run this script, we get the command line runner. And that would probably have things like run server and all the commands we're used to. But we're triggering this. No global state so far. We're, we're doing well. Uh, now we want to start hooking up. Uh, we're writing a website, that's why we're using Django after all. We want to start hooking stuff up to it. So uh, we want to we hook up uh, something at its root. Uh, in Django right now, you'd set a root URL comp. Uh, and that would get everything going. And most people probably never look at that because it comes set, uh, by default for you in the giant settings.py where people look at like three things that are generated for them. They go in to change the static files. They go in to change the time zone. They go in to change the database, so four things. And they go to change the template paths. Those are the only things people look at in this giant settings.py thing when they start a project. Later, they add more stuff in, maybe, but those are the four things they start with. Uh, a couple of years ago, Simon Willison came up with this really cool idea that Django should be turtles all the way down. And what he meant by that was that everything in Django should be a view. And a view, we, we often think of, you know, I write a view function, takes a request, uh, I do all my logic, and, uh, and uh, then I return a response. But from Django's perspective, a view is only that first part and that last part. Django considers a view to be anything that you can call with a request as an argument and get a response back. So the idea Simon had is everything in Django should be a view. Your view functions should be a view. Your URL patterns should be a view. Your middleware should be a view. URL patterns are just an object that take a request and figure out uh, where you're going with it. They, they just dispatch to another view. There's, there's nothing special about them. URL things don't need to be something Django knows about. URLs are just a view that does some logic about dispatching. And so here, instead of saying we have a root URL comp, we're just saying the root view of my application is some URL patterns, which look like this. And these are pretty much the same as your existing URL patterns. I, I screwed with the naming a little because it's kind of how I am. but. At its core, this is basically the same. Um, the only thing that maybe you see is different is uh, a lot of people like the, uh, the using the string Python path things, the dotted Python path inside of a string. And I think those are terrible, and we should probably kill them. Um, just if for absolutely no other reason that they ensure that when you get a trace back, it's as useless as possible. Oh, I, t I had a typo in this file, in my urls.py file? Yeah, that's coming from a Django conf URL defaults. Uh, and it's not going to tell me what file it was in. I hope that's not a problem. You don't need that debugging info, do you? So, uh, so then uh, we pointed this in a view. Now we got to look at what does the view function look like. So this is about how we'd write a view function nowadays. P pretty simple. We have, a, we have the same sort of, we know we have this global state in, uh, in the model that we're getting. And we have a we're calling the render, the render shortcut. And, if we think about it, we know there's a lot of global state in there because I didn't tell it where my template paths were. I didn't tell it what template tag libraries to use. I didn't give it any way to have all this information. So it's getting it from somewhere. And we know that somewhere is settings.py. And we know there's no like setting module being, being passed around. So we know it's just coming from the operating system's environment variable. And that sucks. But otherwise, it's, it's really elegant in my view. It's, I'm not an expert in like what the original canonical model view controller uh, architecture was supposed to be like, but I think if we're talking about MVC for the web, this is this is pretty clean. It takes it takes uh, input, it computes what data we need for uh, the resulting page, and it says where to go to render it. I think that's that's a really beautiful architecture for a view actually, and it would be good if we could keep that. And so here's what I think it maybe probably kind of sort of ought to look like. Uh, there's two really key details here. First, well, three actually. First, what is request.app 
Second, what is this query function? Third, what is this new render function? So what is request.app? It's simply the original application we defined at the beginning. It's that same thing. So it, when, we, when it, a request comes in, uh, sort of the following hierarchy happens. We start with you know, Python app.py run server. And that runs the command line interface and starts a web server on a known application. The web server knows what application it's running. Then when we get a request in, it goes through that URL. It, we, Django creates a request object and attaches the application to it. It goes to the URL patterns, which sees that the path matches uh, the one on this view. So it calls this view, adds in the slug argument, because it parsed that out of, with the regex. And so now we are, we're at our view with request.app. So we, app is just the thing we created earlier. From here on out in Django, app is going to be all the state that we want to pass around, in my view. So app is all that state we were talking about, where your templates are, what your template tag libraries are, what your installed apps are. Uh, all these things go on app. And if you want to have access to them, you need to pass app as an argument somewhere. It, needs, it can come on a request. On, if you're writing a your manage command, it maybe it'd be available itself.app. Celery could have a thing so that app is easily available inside of a task. But you would pass this around everywhere. And so it, it has this method, query. Query is responsible for resolving the issue of how on earth did track.objects.create know what database to hit. It resolves this by query, takes a model as an argument, and then just returns a, uh, a query set that's bound to a particular uh, app. So this means, in fact, if we wanted to run two apps inside the same process that both use the same model, we could. Because that model doesn't know where it, where it goes, doesn't know where it comes from. It can't do any queries on its own. We have to go through request.app.query if we wanted to, if we want to do any queries. And I think it follows that the render method basically does the same thing. It renders a template, but it's responsible for looking in request.app, figuring out what all the set what all the options we have related to uh, related to templates are, where our template uh, folder is, and all that stuff, and then actually sending things in the right place. So now we've maybe got a view that kind of works. You guys are willing to buy into this. So we want to get back to where we originally started. What does a test look like? So this looks actually kind of similar to, uh, to what I originally talked about. The, set, the second version of this test I showed, except for one difference. Uh, this test, the function, is now doing something that test functions don't usually do. It's taking an argument. Uh, Py.test, which is my favorite Python test runner, has this really cool idea of func args. And basically, a func arg is a thing where you can say, I provide this resource if a test wants it. And there are all sorts of ones built in. So uh, one of these built in ones to Py.test is tempter. If, you, if your test wants just like a, a directory to mess around with, pi.test, uh, you, you have a, a test function that takes a tempter argument, and pi.test will be responsible for creating a temporary folder somewhere, giving that to you as an argument to your function, and then once your test function is done, it will be responsible for cleanup. So this is the same idea. Uh, your test needs an app. Your, thing set, your uh, test class says how the app should be configured, and then you just get that app and you just work with it the same way you work with request.app everywhere. So there's no more global state with respect to where we're querying. Uh, there's, there's no more global state at all, really. And so this is, I think, uh, a much improved test that is slightly more verbose uh, for you know, one test. But when you take this and you think these are shared across every single test on a given test case, it's not particularly verbose. Uh, I think it's not at all, and I think it gives you the opportunity of significantly faster tests. This doesn't need to install the auth database. This doesn't need to create permissions for every single model. This doesn't need to install content types. This doesn't need to install you know, the long list of 50 other apps you're using, which are you know, totally unrelated to testing whether you can stream an individual track. So I think in doing this, we managed to solve a few problems. Uh, we solved, I think, what's a pretty common question is, how do I run multiple Django sites in a single process? We can have considerably faster tests in that uh, they don't need to set up all the state that we know our tests don't need. Uh, they just need to set up the state we asked for and just need to tear down that state. 
And we can write better reusable applications because the idea of passing around all the state means, first of all, we don't have ridiculous global settings like uh, does the avatar application resize things on save, which is ridiculous as being a global setting. That's a thing specific to one application uh, that maybe you want to have different types of, uh, maybe you want to install the avatar app twice. Maybe groups can have avatars which do get resized, but users, you want to store the full size avatar for them. Yeah, good luck doing that right now, right? There's one global setting, and I hope you only like it one way. With this, we could easily install the uh, application twice. We would just simply have to uh, create two instances of some class, which we could then include in our URL comp. A reusable app could just be a view that dispatches to its own internal things and wraps them with some logic. You could have the avatar thing simply be like a URL patterns dispatching to what it has with a little bit extra logic. And that's pretty much, I think, all there is to do to fixing Django. Make testing better and uh, get rid of all the global state everywhere, which is, you know, of course, as I said in the beginning, totally infeasible as a uh, backwards compatibility thing, right? That would break everyone's Django application everywhere overnight. And so we need to, I think, work together to try to find a path where we can start making these incremental improvements and to try to get a lot of the advantages. For example, I think having views and everything be a view is a path we can work towards within Django itself. I think that's, that's doable in a backwards compatible way. Um, so I'm hoping that everyone here will sort of take these ideas and you know, try to figure out where are the places we can do these ideas in reasonable backwards compatible ways and what can we do about uh, you know, designing a better next Django or if it absolutely must be a better next framework. But I kind of like Django, so uh, I, wanna, I want the next best framework to be Django again, but as awesome as it was when we first found it and didn't know any of its flaws. Uh, sort of to recap, four uh, really important things we want to do. We want to stop auto-generating files because it means you generate stuff that you don't care about, you don't know about, and that you just, you're stuck maintaining. And it gives you, I think, a lack of a sense of ownership about how you start a project. Uh, we want to kill all the global state uh, because that means that we can't do all sorts of things we want to do, like know what our code does and how it executes. We want to have everything be a, a view because it's a, I think, much cleaner uh, way to think about everything. And the result of all this is we can write isolated tests that really test what we say and that run much more quickly. Just in case anyone's curious, there are tons of other things I still hate in Django that this doesn't solve. Installed apps still is ridiculous. I didn't really think of a better solution. But right now, installed apps is a list of modules where Django will look to uh, find other weird things in. Like, if you have something installed apps, now it's randomly looking for an admin module if you use uh, admin.autodiscover. It's looking for a models.py. It's looking for a template tags module. All this stuff is really weird. I, didn't, I haven't thought of a better way to represent this data, but installed apps is a terrible idea, and the fact that I used it a few places in here should not be considered a, an endorsement of it. Uh, I still think the ORM has a lot of crappy APIs, given an entirely separate talk on that. Um, I think we should probably just replace the template engine with Jinja 2. Template tags suck. Um, I'm sick. The Django template engine is like impossible to make fast. We've done it. We've proved it. Uh, it's really bad. Um, I still love Django. That's why I still use it, even though I, cut, I get up here and rag on it. Uh, thank you guys very much. Questions? Probably I think there's a mic there for them. And the slides are going to go off right after this. Thank you, guys. Awesome. Thank you so much for uh, formulating such a, a distilled critique and really putting it out there in such concrete terms. Um, you've obviously done more thought, thinking about this, having prepared for this, uh, than the rest of us. But like r right away off the top, I see kind of um, three questions. One, it, it seems like if the mechanism for queries is a function of uh, an app, it, um, how then, like right now, the state is that um, managers 
decide how, you know, not necessarily, but sometimes to what database queries go, but at least how they work. So how are managers going to fit in to, to this new paradigm and, and how will, um, the, you know, how, how then can we sort of um, substitute the different, the, the how uh, of how queries work for, um, for, for different models uh, is question number one. Um, question number two is, um, I, I still, I mean, I don't think any of us like installed apps, but then how, um, how are we going to do, like, how, what's going to be the canon for reverse relationships if installed apps disappear? And then three, and this is maybe a little more, um, I guess, kind of, kind of a deeper thinking, to the extent that, like, so global state sucks, of course, but one thing that global state keeps somewhat uh, sort of pasted in place is dry, right? A lot of things can be a little bit drier because we don't have to keep repeating um, bits of local state that are, going to, that are going to be reused over and over again, particularly in tests. So what is kind of the underlying strategy for maintaining dry in the absence of that? OK, so I'll try to answer those uh, basically in order. Thank you. Um, so the first question is, uh, you know, we replace this uh, basically how managers exist with uh, query. And uh, first, I'm pretty sure everyone who's ever written like a manager to add an extra method so hates it like ridiculously. Because this is how it works. You start writing a manager, and you add like some new method that does something really, really cool, like filters tracks that are available in a particular region. And that's really cool. And then you want to do this thing where you happen to have a query set passed in that already exists, and you want to do this filter. So you're like, oh, crap, I can't access this. Like, that's a manager method. I now have a query set. So then you go write your own custom query set, which has the same method name. And then you go change the method on the manager to uh, actually just call the query set method. And this is totally absurd. You shouldn't have to have the logic in two places. So basically the idea I would have is, instead of right now you'd say like objects equals if you want to change the default manager, let's just, have a, let's just specify what the query class should be. Uh, you say query set class equals foo. And you'd put all your new methods on the query set class. And then query would instantiate that with the right parameters so that you have a, uh, a query set bound to a particular app. Uh, I think that solves that. As for how do we better solve like, all the installed apps issues, don't have an answer there. I just, I just know that installed apps feels wrong. If I had a better solution, time willing, I would have put it in here. Still don't have one, sorry. Um, and the third question, how do we balance, I think, my, hate, my insane hatred for global state with dry? Um, and this desire to not repeat ourselves and you know, have the same logic over and over again, which is at least as bad as global state. Um, I think my answer there is passing around this app object uh, is not fundamentally incompatible with dry. Within the uh, PyPy project, uh, we have this idea of an object space. And an object space is basically responsible for all the logic that defines all of how Python works. You want to add two things, you call the add method. You want to do a get item, you call the get item method. You want to call a function, you call the call function method on space with you know, all these things. This is passed everywhere. There are no global methods to define how stuff works. All the state for things like where does sys.modules live lives on this thing. And as a result, all of our tests run inside of a totally isolated space. And also as a result, almost every function in the PyPy interpreter's code base takes a space argument. And in some senses, it's a little extra typing. That's a whole extra you know, five characters plus a comma and a space. It's like seven characters. It's pretty heavy stuff. But, and so we pay the seven character price for every function we write and every function call we make. And it also gives us one place to look where we want to have really core logic to how things work. So the thing I showed at the beginning, the Django application class, Imagine that that's just a base Django application, which is really just responsible for the command line running and having a WSGI app that sets itself on things. And Django application is just a, a conglomeration of base application with something that adds the query method for the Django ORM and with something that adds the render method for the uh, Django template engine or, God willing, the, uh, the Jinja template engine. All of those can be components that we can swap out. Uh, once we start thinking about our application is starting here. So I, I hope that answers your question. Okay, so your first question, how do I do X in Django? Everyone should know that it's Python, do it in Python. Combine, which I agree with completely. 
combined with all the things you'd like to see ripped out of Django, then why would you, and obviously this is your position, why would you tell someone to use Django instead of maybe Flask, which has a core, and then a community set of approved tools, so you can use Jinja 2 or not, you can use SQL Alchemy or not, you can use whatever database, just go to that collection, take the bits you need, and do it with Flask. Uh, so, a lot of times when I talk about Django, I think of Django as a set of components that each individually I hate, and yet somehow in their collective are something way, way better than each of the individuals. I think it would be really cool if Django was, most of what was unique to Django was the request and response object it used, and then all these were, like the ORM, the templates, all these things were things that could be used separately, but the Django just simply had as defaults and had a good comprehensive set of documentation on how you use all these things together. Just because I think these things should be swapped out doesn't mean I don't think Django should still as a project say, this is a good starting point. If you want to build your first web application, you're going to need to know how to use all these different pieces, really. And the web has probably more technologies that you need to know to write something real than anything else. Uh, I was talking with someone, and he, he was telling me about a friend of his who was uh, learning uh, who started as like an iPhone programmer and learned to write a web application. And when he wrote applications for the iPhone, he needed to learn Objective-C and how to use the Interface Builder. And those were like two technologies that had great integration and that you know, he, just, he, he felt like he learned one technology and knew how to write a real app. Then when he went to learn to write a web application, it was like, okay, first you need to know the server-side programming language, then you're gonna need to pick up SQL, then you're gonna need to know HTML, JavaScript, and CSS, and that's like six things you gotta pick up to write you know, something that looks real. And I think for a lot of us, we want our first app to feel like a real thing. I, I, I found it's never fun when your tutorial puts together this toy that looks ridiculous. Like the closer you can get to building something real on your first try, the better you feel, the more you wanna keep going. And I think being able to have one project that is a comprehensive documentation on how you use these pieces together puts us in a place that's maybe better and than just saying, pick your own pieces. But we still have the freedom to pick our own pieces as we learn more. Sorry, just a short follow-up. So what's the difference between Django then and Flask with a set of documentation of here are the default pieces that you should use together and here's kind of our tutorial? We made different, like, I don't think there needs to be a big difference. Uh, Turbo Gears for a long time existed as the framework within the Pylons universe that simply put all the pieces together in one package and gave you how you use these together comprehensively. I, I think it would be a lot better, probably for the Python ecosystem as a whole, if our pieces were interchangeable with everyone else's pieces and we were simply a place that had really great documentation on how to use a set of pieces together. Hi. Um, so, I, I feel like I'm, I'm, I'm hearing where you want to take it, but uh, I'm trying to understand, it, it feels like a shift in philosophy, so I'm trying to understand the, the underlying principles. So, my understanding of Django is, as a core principle is, get your shit to 1.0. And once you got to 1.0, then at least you have the money and, theoretically, and the time and you know, the momentum to be able to work on getting past the 1.0. And so part of that is the uh, anticipation of sane defaults and implicit defaults and trying to make the developer not have to focus on anything beyond what is the functionality I'm trying to build. And what it feels like I'm seeing in, in the, the changes that you want to make is a whole lot more explicitness and a whole lot more conscientious thought about where are, where are the settings that I'm looking for coming from. What do you see as the, in the, the Django 2.0, what do you see as the balance between the get your shit to 1.0 by anticipating what 99% of developers are gonna wanna do from the start and the supporting the extensibility for those projects that are past 1.0? I don't see those as being incompatible at all is my answer. I think get your shit to 1.0 is about making it really easy to put your business logic in one place, to spit out templates, and to define models in a way that makes them really, really easy to query. And I don't think we had to compromise on any of those. I think we still have the really, really expressive Django declarative model syntax. I think we keep the really, really expressive Django query syntax, which I hate on elsewhere, but that still makes it really easy to express a lot of our queries. 
I think we kept the really, really easy uh, template language, hopefully a slightly different one. Um, I think needing to pass around this stuff is not what the bulk of most applications are. You don't spend a lot of time in your applications uh, talking about set headings. And you know, when we talk about passing around the explicit state of what template loaders we're using, the second version of the code, the improved view, didn't have any more code really to do that. You had to access request.app instead of the global render function. And I don't think those handful of characters are what makes a difference between something that's really easy to get a 1.0 shipped with and something that's not. Um, so with uh, something like request.app.query, um, what are your kind of, uh, uh, what's, when, how do you decide when you would have this kind of extension architecture where you're adding uh, functions to app uh, versus just passing the app around? And are you worried about app becoming kind of a dumping ground for uh, these kind of extensions? That is a great question. And I, unfortunately, I think it's the last question. I'll answer that. Uh, sorry to be behind you. Um, this is a question I have not thought a lot about. It's a really good question. App shouldn't be a dumping ground. Um, yeah, I don't. I haven't thought about where we draw the line, how we think about that problem enough yet, but it's a great question. Like, Salary wants to expose a way for a Django application to put something on a queue. Does it have a new like, mix in that you use with your application, Django Salary, and then, then you call uh, request.app.defer some task, or is there a global defer function that takes an app as a uh, parameter? I don't have an answer to that question yet. It's a, it's a really good question. It's the kind of thing we need to be thinking about more. Thank you guys very much.